against other religions and with all people of goodwill. But they also owe to the others to testify with the God of Jesus Christ, that is the Trinitarian God who is love. This brings us to a further aspect of discourse about God, which has been neglected in Western theology for a long time. After a period resembling the sleep of sleeping beauty, the doctrine of the Trinity has again actually once more in regard to historical research and systematic analysis alike. Self-evidently, the doctrine of the Trinity is not a matter of a numerical problem or a kind of higher mathematics attempting to show how one and the same reality can one and three at the same time. The Trinity can only be made comprehensible as on the basis of the nature of love. Love wants to be one with the other without dissolving into the other. Love does not absorb the other, it means being one while maintaining its own identity as well as the identity of the other and finding its ultimate fulfillment. Love means being one while acknowledging the otherness of the other. But it does not stop at intimate duality, but instead progresses beyond its own boundaries into a shared third identity in which it represents and fully realizes itself. In this sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is a precise explication of the sentence or is love, which is found in the first letter of John. God is not a solitary God. He is in himself communion, and only thus can he bring us into his communion. In this context, I can only hint at this aspect in order to show that the doctrine of the Trinity enables a new approach to the most difficult existential question of the doctrine of God, the problem of DLC. I mean the question, why is there so much innocent suffering? How can God, if he is omnipotent and loving, permit such <coughs> suffering? Why does he not intervene? If he is loving but not almighty, then he is not God. If he is almighty but not loving, then he is an evil demon. Obviously, the doctrine of the Trinity cannot solve these questions, but it can shine a light in the darkness, and it can help us to survive the darkness of suffering and dying. It can show that love as great literature is always known, always means renunciation, indeed, that love and death belong together. That is also true of Trinitarian love. The divine persons are, of course, like everything in God, infinite. They must therefore make room for one another. They must, as it were, relinquish themselves to make space for the other person. And this cannot itself Religion mode of existence enables God on the cross to identify himself with that which is most alien to him, the sinner, and who has deserved death, and to enter in his opposite into the night of death. God can take his death, this death upon himself without being conquered by it, but instead thereby vanquish it and establish the foundation of new life. Thus, the cross is the utmost that is possible to God in his self relinquishing love. It is the it or malus cogitari requi. The doctrine of the Trinity does uh, not thereby give a direct answer to the question of innocent suffering. How could it? But it is able to be light in the darkness that helps us not to despair of God in our utmost need and distress, but to know that in our extreme helplessness, the crucified God stands by us, so that in all our cries and despair the profundis, we are able to bear all in faith. The doctrine of the Trinity is the form of monotheism which permits existential survival in the face of the enormous extent of suffering 
in the world. But can God suffer? Can he suffer with us? The mainstream of traditional theology has always denied this. It has uh, understood suffering as a deficit and therefore excluded the possibility that God could suffer. On this point, a shift has occurred in the case of a large part of modern, more modern theology. Self-evidently, if God suffers, he does not suffer in a human but in a divine manner. For God's suffering cannot be something external which befalls him. God's suffering cannot be a passive accident, nor can it be the expression of a deficiency, but only be expression of a suffering self-determination. God is not passively affected by the suffering of his creatures. He allows himself in freedom and love to be affected by the suffering of his creatures. He allows himself to be moved by sympathy, sympathy. Indeed, his heart recoils in the face of the misery of his creatures. He is not an apathetic, but a sympathetic God, a God who can partain with us, God who can suffer with us. God does not glorify or deify suffering, nor does he simply eliminate it. He redeems and transforms it. The cross is a passage to resurrection and transfiguration. The theology of the cross and Genesis, conceptualized in the doctrine of the Trinity, becomes an Easter theology of exaltation and transfiguration. It becomes hope against hope in the living God who gives life. Spe, salvi, we are, so the scripture says, redeemed in hope, saved in hope, is the title, therefore, of the second encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI. Fifth and last chapter, the truth of God, love as a meaning of existence. If one takes the words that God is love to their logical conclusion, it follows that love is the all-encompassing horizon of reality and the meaning of existence. With this thesis that love is the horizon and the interpretive key for all reality, we meet the requirement we set above, that is to discover reality as predicated on God as our premise. We do not thereby prove the truth of God in, the, in a scientific sense, but we do prove it to be rationally comprehensible. This is that love is a meaning of existence, represents a kind of revolution in the field of metaphysical thought, since this insight leads to the realization that neither the self-subsistent substance nor the autonomous modern subject are the real and fundamental reality. The starting point and the foundation are instead to be found in what which was for Aristotle merely accidental and the weakest reality of existence, namely the relation. The theology of the Trinity leads us to a relational and personal ontology. Just as in God the subsistence of the Trinitarian person is grounded in relation in an analogous manner, it means in a similar similarity which is at the same time more to similar Relations are the fundamental reality also in the created realm. The human being must from this perspective be understood as a relation, re, relational and dialogic being, a dialogic being. He does not find his fulfillment in forcible self-assertion, self, self but in respectful and loving recognition of the otherness of the other. This is a fundamental paradox and the dialectic of Christian existence. Only he who loses his life will find it. Neither force, money, power, and influence, not the self-assertion of the fittest, but instead tolerance, 